Dressing is a way of life. Fashions fade, style is eternal. In 2008, the world lost the genius visionary Yves Saint Laurent, who revolutionized and transformed feminine fashion, freeing women of prejudices and stereotypes that beset women. I want to find the equivalent to men's suits for women. He was a lover of aesthetics in all its forms, the fine arts, literature. He had one of the biggest and most valuable private book collections in the world. He also loved looking at his mother's magazines, Jardin des Modes, Paris Match, and Vogue, from which he would cut out photographs of models to make his own collection of paper dolls. He would paint and glue on dresses he designed and made himself on them. He was passionate about Rimbaud's poetry, theater and dance, painting and sculpture, Bach and 19th century opera sung by the incomparable diva Maria Callas who accompanied him for decades. He created his designs along with his faithful best friends, a series of four French bulldogs, all named Mujik. His sensitive spirit drowned him in the depths of depression, which strengthened his character and took him to dazzling heights. As he announced his retirement from the profession that he loved so much, he said he did it amazed but sober. Many still consider him to be the best in French and world fashion. Yves was born on the 1st of August, 1936, and died on the 1st of June, 2008, after a battle with brain cancer. Yves Henri Donat Mathieu Saint Laurent was the son of Lucien and Charles Mathieu Saint Laurent. His father had an insurance company and a chain of movie theaters. He belonged to the French middle class in Oran, Algeria, a colony of France, where he was born after his two sisters. The family frequently spent vacations in Troville in Normandy. They were a very tight-knit family and maintained a close relationship up to his last days. While Yves was growing up, his interior world, full of creativity and fantasy, protected him from the harassment by his classmates, who tormented him because of his delicate manners, soft way of speaking, and the shyness that he was never able to completely shake off. As a child, Yves Saint Laurent would play pretending to be a dressmaker and imagined that he had his own fashion house. Later, as a teen, between 1953 and 1954, he imagined a fictional high fashion house in his future that he called Yves Mathieu Saint Laurent Haute Couture Plus Vendôme. He designed complete wardrobes on silhouettes that he decorated with tempera, markers, and watercolors. He even dressed them in snippets of cloth that he would secretly cut from his mother's dresses. He built a small wooden stage to recreate the staging and costumes of the plays that were being presented in Parisian theaters. At 17, Yves Saint Laurent participated in the annual competition of the International Wool Secretariat. This very important contest in the world of fashion became the first step in his career. The jury included prestigious courtiers like Hubert de Givenchy and Christian Dior. Saint Laurent received third place in the dress category and traveled to Paris with his mother to pick up the prize. His father asked some of his contacts to help him meet Michel de Brunoff, editor-in-chief of Vogue, who Yves admired. De Brunoff was a very influential person in Saint Laurent's career. He encouraged him to continue designing and then to move to Paris to advance his career in the fashion industry. 
Once he had finished school, Eve moved to Paris in 1954 to study in the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture. Michel de Brunoff introduced him to Christian Dior, who was so impressed by his sketches that he hired him immediately as a modeler and later appointed him as his assistant. In November 1954, Yves Saint Laurent participated again in the International Wool Secretariat Contest, winning first and third place prizes in the dress category. Karl Lagerfeld, who at that time was 21 years old, won first prize in the coat category. He and Saint Laurent met at this time and maintained a lifelong relationship that wavered between friendship and rivalry. Given the demands of his work, Yves Saint Laurent decided to quit his schooling in 1955 to dedicate his full attention to his career at the Maison Dior. In 1957, when Christian Dior died of a heart attack, Yves Saint Laurent was named artistic director of the firm at the expressed wishes of Dior before his death. I started three years ago with Mr. Dior and uh, was trained by him. And now I continue with the same. Yves Saint Laurent coincided with the businessman Pierre Berger at Dior's funeral, though they didn't meet each other until some time later when they were introduced at a dinner party by Marie-Louise Bousquet of Harper's Bazaar, who thought they should meet. Berger was instantly fascinated by the young man and became Yves Saint Laurent's lover and business associate for the rest of his life. In 1958, Yves Saint Laurent, already at the reins of Dior, moved away from the wasp waist and tight tube skirt, which restricted a woman's movement, and moved on to his creation of the trapeze model, which granted them more flexibility and freedom to move. The next evolution in style by Saint Laurent for Maison Dior consisted of lightening and shortening the dresses of Monsieur Dior. He eliminated corsets using lighter cloths to free the female body and allow it enhanced movement. International fashion critics baptized him with the nickname Little Prince, as he was considered to be the heir to all of King Dior's teachings. Vogue USA wrote, a sensation is racing through Paris, something new for the city and for France. The growing influence of youth. Yves Saint Laurent brought fresh air to the fashion world and stimulated the economy of the nation through the fashion industry's contributions and their impact on French commerce. In just one year and eight months, the time he had been the artistic director of Maison Dior, it billed 50% of all the fashion exports of the country. Royals and celebrities from the entertainment industry began to look for him to dress them. In 1959, the aristocratic Farah Diba married the Shah of Iran and would become empress of what was once known as Persia, wearing a Dior gown designed by Saint Laurent. As a man with an open mind, liberal and ahead of his time, he believed in gender equality, in fluidity, and the non-identification of sexuality, following pre-established social patterns. He made one of his most important contributions by conceiving his creations for women, basing them on pieces that until then were exclusively masculine, such as suits with coats and long pants. With the arrival of the 60s, he begins to be inspired by the events in the streets and launches a collection of leather jackets, dresses, and dark coats. The critics cataloged it as extravagant and the proposal was not welcomed by the more conservative clients of the Maison, who felt offended at the breaking of its established rules and traditions. In September 1960, Yves Saint Laurent was drafted to serve in the army against his will, since he didn't want to fight in the war. Within just a few days in the military, he had a nervous breakdown, once again caused by the mocking and joking on his gentle way of being. 
He was admitted into the Val de Gras Hospital Psychiatric Center, where he stayed for two and a half months. His partner, Pierre Berger, visited him all the time until he was finally able to get him out. Despite his great height, he left weighing just over 77 pounds with an addiction to tranquilizers that would last 20 years. When he returned to Paris, everything had changed. Marcel Boussac, the owner of Maison Dior, had taken the opportunity to substitute him, considering him too avant-garde for his time. Boussac preferred to avoid problems with his clients, and at the same time censored his anti-military stance. The post of artistic director of the House of Dior was now held by Marc Boan, who was much more conservative and traditional. This meant that in 1961, Yves Saint Laurent was forced to abandon his cherished Maison Dior. After a trip to the Canary Islands to recuperate, Pierre Berger encouraged him to open his own high fashion house, telling him that they would sue his previous employer and with this capital, they would launch their own business. They won the lawsuit, and in 1962, Saint Laurent was ready to launch the first collection of which he was lord and master, free from others' criteria or opinions. Throughout his entire life, Saint Laurent remained faithful to the idea that fashion was an attitude, a way of living, and not a way of dressing. The fashion house was represented by a logo of his initials, intertwined vertically, a distinctive acronym created by the designer Cassandra. The symbol has become an internationally recognized symbol, even today. With the resounding success they reaped, Pierre Berger and Yves Saint Laurent moved into an apartment on the Place Vauban in Paris. The space reflected the good taste and the class of the two men, admirers of architecture, pieces of art and design. The flat was decorated with objects chosen by them, including a Sanufo bird sculpture, which was the first thing they purchased together and with which they began to develop as art collectors. As his career began to take off, his finances flourished and his emotional life stabilized. Yves Saint Laurent continued to work relentlessly, creating pieces that marked history. Among the most important contributions to fashion by Yves Saint Laurent were transparent blouses, the safari jacket, the Mondrian dress, the tuxedo suit for women called Le Smoking, gabardines, and car coats initially designed to be worn in convertibles. Yves Saint Laurent set up the reconstruction of the seam to free the body. He immodestly claimed to be the creator of the wardrobe for the modern woman. Let's take a tour through different eras in the life of Yves Saint Laurent. Isn't elegance forgetting what one is wearing? In 1962, important personalities came to see the presentation of Yves Saint Laurent's first solo collection at 30 Rue Spontini. Among those present were important journalists and designers, the Princess of England, the Countess of Paris, the Baroness de Rothschild, the dancer and choreographer Roland Petit, the writer Francois Segon, who euphorically gave him a standing ovation for his original creations. The trench coat was one of the acclaimed pieces. The courtier transformed masculine dress codes to create women's wear. The raincoats were originally worn by English officers during the First World War. Saint Laurent took them out and dusted them off to set them free to walk the streets and protect the Parisian women from the cold, who turned the city of light into an infinite catwalk. The following year, Yves Saint Laurent accepted an invitation to design the costumes for the beautiful Italian actress Claudia Cardinal and the beautiful French actress Capuchine for their respective roles in the well-known comedy The Pink Panther. The film was directed by the American director Blake Edwards, and the English actor Peter Sellers also starred in the film as the famous Inspector Clouseau. 
In the same year, 1963, the dance star Zizi Jean Mayer asked Yves Saint Laurent to design the famous central costume of the show Champagne Rosé, for which he made a striking creation, made in rooster, pheasant, and ostrich feathers, dyed in different shades of pink and fuchsia. In 1964, Yves Saint Laurent launched his first perfume, Y, which he defined as exuberant, heavy, and languid. It was common in Parisian fashion houses to go into perfumery to accompany the right dresses. Saint Laurent never abandoned the work of perfumery, achieving aromas that remain in the ranks of some of the most sought after and sold perfumes in history. In 1965, he met the English dancer Margot Fontaine and the Russian dancer Rudolf Nureyev. They were partners in many shows and together received many praises during their years of performances. Yves Saint Laurent, enthralled by show business personalities, became great friends with both of them and dressed the artist both on and off stage on numerous occasions. That same year, the Parisian actress Catherine Deneuve, who was married to the prestigious British photographer David Bailey, had been invited to meet the Queen of England. Deneuve called Saint Laurent to dress her for the occasion. It was the beginning of a close friendship that would last four decades. Catherine then asked Saint Laurent to design the costumes for her character Severine in Belle de Jour, a mythical film by the acclaimed Spanish director Luis Buñuel, winner of the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival in 1967. In 1965, Yves Saint Laurent introduced art into his personal vision of fashion with the Mondrian series. In addition to a line of dresses with colors and forms inspired by the art of the Dutch painter, he also designed a dress as a tribute to the American pop artist Tom Wesselman and another in homage to the Russian abstract painter Sergei Polyakov. In 1966, Saint Laurent dared to reveal the female body with translucent fabrics. They were called the best blouses since the ones Coco Chanel had made. Later in 1968, he did it again with a dress of sheer organza and a belt of ostrich feathers that would go to the altar of haute couture costumes in history. In his autumn-winter 1966 collection, Yves Saint Laurent presented his most iconic piece, the tuxedo. This garment owes its name to the fact that it was usually worn in smoking rooms. The function of this suit was to protect clothes from the smell of cigarettes in a space that was reserved only for men. Saint Laurent used the aesthetic codes of the suit and adapted them to the female body, making it an indispensable piece full of style and elegance. In 1966, he also became the first courtier to open a ready-to-wear shop, mass-produced fashion garments signed with his name. It was located at 21 Rue Tourneau in Paris. Saint Laurent created a different collection that was made to measure, although he looked after the same care and dedication. The designer was interested in the needs of the woman of that time, who were oppressed by male chauvinistic patterns, and that her clothes should look the same, even though she did not have the means to dress in haute couture. Yves Saint Laurent wanted to democratize fashion, This is how he founded Saint Laurent Rive Gouche with a more affordable, ready-to-wear fashion line. It sought gender equality and opened up possibilities for reaching female consumers from different backgrounds. Under the motto, Down with the Ritz, Long Live the Street, Saint Laurent launched his homage to the rebellious students with leather jackets, mini skirts, and garments that broke molds and imposed trends that would live on. Along with what he did in the world of fashion, the designer went on vacation to Marrakech with Pierre Berger. The place became a sanctuary, his refuge from the disciplined life. 
There he grew his hair and beard, adopting a hippie look, which made him look very attractive. Hair was an obsession for Saint Laurent, who had suffered an alopecia crisis when he returned from his military service experience due to stress, anxiety, panic attacks, and medication he took to calm himself. Yves Saint Laurent was a man of rituals and superstitions. At home, he worked in white Moroccan-style dressing gowns or kaftans, and he never took off his big-rimmed glasses. He fell in love with the city at first sight, and it became his best therapy for rest and relaxation. Saint Laurent, who was a hermit at heart, a misanthrope, would lock himself in his house in the garden with lemon trees that he bought with Pierre Berger. Under the starry sky, he found what his idol, Rimbaud, called making fire, becoming the creator of a whole new universe. Despite being introverted and timid, when people gained his trust, they became a part of an exclusive circle, a family of sorts, to which he was loyal beyond measure. Saint Laurent invited these friends to be with him and Pierre in the second house they bought in Marrakech. It was there that they celebrated life, held big parties, and committed excesses. Yves Saint Laurent met Betty Catrou in 1967 at Chez Régine, a Parisian nightclub. She was working as a model for Chanel at the time, and Saint Laurent persuaded her to come and work for him. After much insistence, she acquiesced. He and Betty were like doppelgangers, or twins separated at birth. Physically, they were tall, thin, stylish. Their conversations were a few words, but profound and existentialist. Betty represented the spirit of the brand at that time, an impetuous, brave woman with considerable presence. Even today, she continues to be one of the images of the fashion house. Two other stars who are currently part of the brand's image are actor Vincent Gallo and actress Zoe Kravitz. They set new standards in beauty and fashion. Returning to the 60s, American heir John Paul Getty Jr. and his wife Talitha also met Pierre Berger and Yves Saint Laurent in Morocco. They became part of the Friends of Marrakech. The atmosphere in the place was bohemian and hedonistic, where they enjoyed life, surrounded by the splendor of lush vegetation, fountains, and pools where they cooled off from the heat. Yves Saint Laurent didn't like to travel, unless it was to Morocco. For his spring-summer 1967 collection, he was inspired by Africa creating a series of dresses with materials from the region, such as raffia, wood, and straw. The collection was renovated with handmade and handcrafted techniques, which kept it away from the overcrowded industrial road, creating more personal pieces, such as those inspired by the sculptures of the Bambara in Mali. Saint Laurent was one of the first courtiers to work with black models. In 1962, Fidelia was the first black model to climb a haute couture catwalk to show off her pieces. Over the years, Eman, later David Bowie's wife, was one of his muses, along with Katocha Nayan and Rebecca Ayoko. Naomi Campbell has stated that he got her her first Vogue cover and that Tyra Banks was one of his favorites. Then Alec Weck was another of his chosen ones. In 1967, Yves Saint Laurent proposed his first trouser suit. As with the tuxedo, he adapted the traditionally masculine garment to the female body with wide pants, tight sleeves, and a pinched waist, all accessorized with high-heeled shoes, jewelry, neckties, and flashy hats. It was the same year he first presented the Safari or Saharan jacket, a unique design created for a photo essay for Vogue that made it a classic. Cotton and light brown in color with deep braided neckline and four large pockets, it became popular for its sexy style out of the African desert. In 1968, student protests known as May 68 shook the streets of Paris, becoming another inspiration for Yves Saint Laurent's designs. Year in which he also made Catherine Deneuve's wardrobe for Alain Cavalier's film La Chamade. 
In 1968, he opened a boutique in New York and another in London the following year. Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger met Andy Warhol in 1968. They became friends. Both Saint Laurent and Warhol were timid and of like minds. In 1970, Warhol spent some time in Paris filming Love and became even closer to the designer. In 1972, Warhol painted a series of portraits of Saint Laurent, and in 1986, some others of his faithful French bulldog, Mujik. Some say that when Saint Laurent found out that Warhol also immortalized his competitor, Valentino, he vowed to burn the portrait he had made of him. But he did not keep his word, and the work was with him until the end of his days. That same year, Saint Laurent was introduced to Lulu de la Falaise, who became another of his close friends and confidants. When they met, Saint Laurent was enchanted by this very classy woman who combined objects she found in antique stores and flea markets with luxurious garments. Lulu started working at the studio in 1972 and stayed with Saint Laurent for 30 years in charge of accessories. The so-called mono or overalls were first shown in the spring-summer 1968 collection. It was a wide garment used by aviators to which Yves Saint Laurent managed to give the opposite effect, using designs and materials that revealed the female body. That same year, in 1968, on one of his trips to Marrakech, Yves Saint Laurent fell in love with a garment, the kaftan, the nightgown-style dress that was integrated into his later collections for its versatility and variety of fabrics and colors. In 1970, Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger moved to a 1,900-square-foot split-level apartment at 55 Rue Babylone in Paris. There, Saint Laurent and Berger mixed in an eclectic way different styles and periods with very valuable works by Francisco de Goya, Edward Byrne Jones, Andy Warhol, Henri Matisse, Piet Mondrian, Theodore Gericault, and Constantine Brancusi then acquired masterpieces of modern art, art deco, antiques from Egypt and Rome, as well as works from the 19th century masters for their incomparable collection, distributed among their homes. Yves Saint Laurent had great friends who were also his muses, very close friendships that accompanied him throughout his life. He was very stable in his deep affections, However, one of his first sources of inspiration from his time at Dior was his inseparable model, Victoire Dutrelo, and after years of fraternal friendship, they grew apart due to sentimental themes related to jealousy and disloyalty. Many divas bowed to him, from Marlena Dietrich, who precisely the year Yves Saint Laurent was born, was starred in a film that was shot in Algeria, The Garden of Allah, Audrey Hepburn was only unfaithful to her beloved Givenchy with Saint Laurent. Diana Ross, Sylvie Vartan, Marina Schiano, Paloma Picasso, who collaborated with him, and Cher are also among his biggest fans. With the passage of time, the models Claudia Schiffer, Inez de la Fressange, Carla Bruni, Laetitia Costa became his friends and accompanied him in his last farewell. During an interview, when asked who he admired the most, he simply answered, my models. In 1971, Yves Saint Laurent presented his Liberation Collection, inspired by the Second World War. The short dresses, the platform shoes, the shoulder pads, the overloaded makeup, and the fancy hairstyles caused such a scandal that the collection became known as Scandal. It was a show criticized by the press, which inadvertently gave a great boost to the retro trend. Saint Laurent was not afraid of criticism. He always believed in his talent, his creative capacity and discipline, which kept him working on his designs for hours. His passion for art was intertwined with his inspiration he found in the works of artists like Brock, Delacroix, Ingres, Matisse, Mondrian, Picasso, Velasquez, and Vermeer, whose elements he captured in his creations. Mondrian was the first he approached in 1965, and whose rigor seduced him. 
Yves Saint Laurent thought that one could not go any further in painting, and that the 20th century's masterpiece belonged to Mondrian. Yves, at the same time, lived the madness of the 60s and 70s with a life of debauchery at the side of friends like Mick Jagger and Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. In 1971, Mick Jagger married the Nicaraguan Bianca Jagger in San Tropez. The bride chose a dress consisting of a white Yves Saint Laurent cell skirt and tuxedo and a tulle and flower pamela. That same year, Yves Saint Laurent launched two new fragrances, Rive Gouche for women and Pour Homme. Saint caused a scandal when he posed nude for the legendary advertisement in a photograph taken by Jean-Louis C.F. These were turbulent times in 1972, when Jane Fonda accepted the Oscar for Best Actress for her role in Clute, wearing a sober black Yves Saint Laurent pantsuit. In the following years, the designer did collections inspired by different cultures, such as the Russian, Spanish, and Chinese, defying even more conventions and awakening fascination in everyone. Throughout his career, Saint Laurent used colors, forms, and materials from Africa, Russia, Spain, and China for his extraordinary creative journeys. His 1976 collection, Operas and Russian Ballets, evoked the Russia of the Tsar's era and represented it in operas and ballets. Luxurious textiles like chiffon, silk, velvet, and gold lame, along with lots of brilliant colors, took everyone on a surprising voyage to those distant lands. In 1977, the Españoles y Románticos collection captured the spirit of Spain and an imaginary atmosphere full of bullfighting, costumes of lights, flamenco art, velvet gypsy corsets, and a syncretic atmosphere inspired by the opera Carmen, based on the Prospero Merimé story. Then came the Chinese collection. With all its references to this immense Asian country, it was synchronized with the launch of his new fragrance, Opium. China was the new source of inspiration for the designer. In 1978, he rented an extraordinarily luxurious yacht to launch the perfume with the scandalous name, which was a clear reference to the addictive drug. The publicity campaign starred Jerry Hall, who at the time was Mick Jagger's partner. In 1980, Pierre and Yves bought a new house in Marrakech, the Jardin Majorelle. It was a beautiful 20s-era villa on 10 acres of land with exuberant gardens. It had been owned by the French painter of the same name and was going to be converted into a hotel. However, the two turned it into their secret oasis to which they traveled to various times each year and where the designer's ashes were spread. That same year, Yves Saint Laurent paid homage to poets he admired by writing references to Aragon, Apollinaire, et Cocteau on his designs. The Shakespeare wedding dress that he designed for this combination of fashion and literature was a lavish brocade gown decorated with jewels. Throughout the fall and winter collection of 1981, Yves Saint Laurent paid tribute to painters he admired, like Matisse and Laguerre, whose patterns and colors inspired him. In 1983, he launched the perfume Paris, impregnating the world with an aroma that paid tribute to the city he adored with scents of roses and violets. The same year, he inaugurated an exposition in the Metropolitan Museum of New York. Yves Saint Laurent, 25 years of design, curated by the editor and columnist Diana Vreeland. It was the first time in history that a retrospective of the work of a living designer was held. In 1985, the exposition Yves Saint Laurent 1958 to 1985 was shown at the Palace of Fine Arts in Beijing, given the impact of his body of work and the quantity of followers in the giant country. That same year, he created the costumes for the French film goddess Isabelle Adjani for the film Subway by French director Luc Besson. 
For his spring-summer 1990 collection, Yves Saint Laurent paid tribute to people he admired, such as Bernard Buffet, Christian Dior, Catherine Deneuve, Zizi Jean Mayer, Marilyn Monroe, Marcel Proust, and a fashion show that recreated the Jardin de Guermantes from In Search of Lost Time by Proust, which symbolizes the French middle class, luxury, and aristocracy. In 1993, he launched his perfume, Champagne, which was the subject of a lawsuit due to the name registered for sparkling wines exclusively from this French region. The fragrance was discontinued and is now called ivresse or drunkenness in French, a cool play on words for the aroma of peach, apricot, and jasmine. In 1997, the brand opened its first store in Moscow, and Yves Saint Laurent stopped making the ready-to-wear collection, handing it over to the Moroccan-Israeli designer Albert Elbaz, who took over in 1998. In 1998, for the finals of the FIFA World Cup, an entire stadium featured the models who filled the playing field with 300 historic creations. Ravel's bolero mixed with drums from the band Metal Voice supplied the background for this unforgettable event for Saint Laurent, who was among the audience. The following year, in 1999, the Gucci group bought Yves Saint Laurent. The designer retired, announcing it at a press conference and presenting his latest retrospective parade at the Centre Pompidou. The American designer Tom Ford then took over the ready-to-wear business. In 2002, Yves Saint Laurent said farewell to the world of fashion. The Italian Stefano Pilati was named creative director for the brand in 2004, a position he held until 2012. That year, the French-Tunisian Eddy Slaman, who ran the men's line of Yves Saint Laurent, took over the reins of the women's collection, inaugurating a new era in which the name Yves was removed from the brand and the name was changed to just Saint Laurent. Yves Saint Laurent died in Paris in 2008, leaving an irreparable void in the world of high fashion. In 2016, Eddie Slaman left the Maison after four years at the helm. The Italian-Belgian designer Anthony Vaccarello took over when he left and is still the creative director today. Pierre Berger, Yves Saint Laurent's life and career companion, died in 2017. He was the entrepreneurial mind behind the creative genius that revolutionized women's apparel. Berger was born on November 14, 1930, on the island of Oleron, off the west coast of France. He outlined the business strategies and helped Saint Laurent to create his own brand, to focus on production and to believe in himself. They managed to combine love and work in a deep and enriching relationship. Under Berger's determination, the firm was listed on the Paris Stock Exchange in 1989. The romantic relationship between Saint Laurent and Berger lasted two decades. At the beginning of the 80s, Pierre decided to break off the relationship with Yves because he couldn't handle Saint Laurent's frenetic party life, though he partook in it intermittently. Their business partnership, their friendship and loyalty, however, never ended. Since the death of his former partner in 2008, Berger dedicated himself to preserving his legacy. In 2009, he auctioned off part of the art collection that they had formed together over more than 40 years. A year after Yves Saint Laurent's death, Berger auctioned off his entire art collection through Christie's. It was considered the auction of the century and yielded over 373 million euros. Sotheby's auctioned off his collection of books, considered one of the rarest and most valuable private libraries in history, resulting in more than 60 years of acquisitions. 
The auction reached a result of over 11 million euros. Most of the proceeds from the auctions went to AIDS-related causes and to the Pierre Berger Yves Saint Laurent Foundation, which in 2017 opened two museums, one in Paris and the other in Marrakech. Both exhibit collections on the legacy of the fashion designer. Yves Saint Laurent liked to say that Coco Chanel had freed women and that he had given them power. In 1968, on Dim Dam Dom, a French TV show, Chanel said that Saint Laurent was her spiritual heir. Yves Saint Laurent created an aesthetic concept in keeping with his era, striving for it to remain valid through the decades. He captured the spirit of his times, combining what was happening on the streets and the real needs of women with a world of French arts and splendor. In the 40 years that Yves Saint Laurent led his brand, he gave women's clothing straight lines, elegance, and comfort. At the same time, he reinvented historical garments, such as the jacket, the tuxedo, the tunic, the raincoat, and the Saharan garment, and finally concluded that, a woman's most beautiful garment is her nudity. Over the years, I have learned that what is important in a dress is the woman who is wearing it. I have always believed that fashion was not only to make women more beautiful, but also to reassure them, give them confidence. I am not a courtier, but an artisan, a maker of happiness.